Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Master the NEC, where we talk about the National Electrical Code and all things electrically related. My name is Paul Abernathy, your host, as always, and welcome to the video. Now, today's video, we're going to talk about utilizing 250.122's table. Now, what is that table all about? That table is about sizing equipment grounding conductors, and we're talking about of the wire type. So that's what we're going to focus on today, talking about how to size an equipment grounding conductor based on table 250.122. Now, a little disclaimer. We're not going to talk about all of the aspects that are in the subdivisions of 250.122. For example, typically when you increase the size of an ungrounded conductor, say for a long distance due to voltage drop or because of an engineer's specified design, Usually you increase the equipment grounding conductor based on a ratio of the size of the conductors that you increased. And we're not going to talk about that in this episode. That is very specific and we'll do that in another video. Here we're talking about simply sizing an equipment grounding conductor based on some principles of overcurrent device size and the utilizing of table 250.122. That's all we're going to deal with in this video. So let's get started. So as you can see, the topic is going to be sizing equipment grounding conductors, and we're going to specifically be utilizing table 250.122. So first things first, as with anything, we have to understand the definition of what an equipment grounding conductor is. It's a conductive path or path that is part of an effective ground fault current path and connects normally non-current carrying metal parts of equipment together and to the system's grounding conductor or to the grounding electroconductor or both. Uh, and this is under the purview of code making panel five. So we know what an equipment grounding conductor is. If you're an apprentice, journeyman, even a master, you've been doing this for years. And when we're talking about of the wire type, you're pretty much familiar with, if it's PVC, for example, of that type of wiring method, that you're going to put an equipment grounding conductor of the wire type. If it's insulated, it'll be green. It could be bare, but you'll put that inside of the raceway system. And that's your equipment grounding conductor. Okay, it's pretty simple. But when we're talking about of the wire type, if you go to 250.118, that's going to give you a list of all the different acceptable equipment grounding conductors. And that's where you're going to see rigid metal conduit, intermediate metal conduit, EMT, electrometallic tubing. You're going to see these other types of equipment grounding conductors, and they're all acceptable. As long as everything's done just right, you have couplings, connectors, you connect everything together, then that raceway can be utilized as an equipment grounding conductor and you wouldn't have to put a wire type inside of that raceway. Now, most engineers will probably specify the wire type in there because they feel it's more reliable. But at the end of the day, if you make up all those fittings, those couplings and everything right, EMT, rigid metal conduit, intermediate metal conduit, and a couple others in those lists, um, all of those in the list would qualify as an equipment grounding conductor. But again, we're gonna talk about the wire type in this episode. So here you see on the right, we have some questions. Equipment grounding conductors, you see what it is. It's usually, if it's insulated, it's gonna be green. If it's considered a covered equipment grounding conductor, then it's gonna be inside of a cable assembly. For example, non-metallic sheath cable, you know, N and B, you've seen it, you put it in residential homes. Well, there's a bare equipment grounding conductor inside there, usually wrapped in paper. And that is a bare equipment ground, but it's considered covered because it's underneath the sheathing in a cable assembly. Same thing would be for SER or SEU, that's service entrance cable. Uh, same thing for tray cable. It could be a bare or an insulated in there, okay? But the bare inside of a cable is considered covered, all right? So kind of gives you the aspect. All of these are listed in 250.118, item number one. It tells you that an equipment granite conductor can be bare, covered, or insulated. Now, with that said, there are times in the code which will require that an equipment grounding conductor has to be insulated. Most notably, for example, branch circuits to patient care spaces in 517.13a and b. The b will tell you that the equipment grounding conductor has to be insulated. Okay, so that's some examples of when it would have to be insulated. Okay, also you get some of those aspects when you're dealing with swimming pools as well in 680 where the equipment grounding conductor would need to be insulated. Okay, now what is the function of an equipment grounding conductor? The function is that when you tie all these metal parts together and I have some kind of ground fault that takes place in these metal parts, say a, an ungrounded conductor makes unintentional contact with the metal frame of the equipment, you create what's called a ground fault condition. And under that ground fault condition, the current will skyrocket 
at that ground fault. And when it skyrockets at that ground fault, the overcurrent protector device, whether it's a circuit breaker or a fuse, can detect that increased level of current beyond its actual rating. And when it does that, it will cause that overcurrent device to react very quickly and shut the circuit down, okay? Now, the other important thing is that, as you see, it has to be an effective ground fault, pair, ground fault current path, and it has to be low impedance. So how do we get this low impedance? We effectively tie all of the metal parts together to our equipment grounding conductors so it all acts as one symbiotic system. So that if we get some kind of ground fault on these metal, normally non-current carrying metal parts, that we can get that current away quickly by tripping the breaker or blowing the fuse. Okay, And the only way you can do that is by having an effective ground fault current path that has a low impedance, intentionally constructed path. That means tying everything together and doing all the terminations properly, okay, in accordance with 250.8. So you got to make sure you make all those terminations right to do that. Now, that's the function. Why do we need it? Again, the quicker that we can clear that breaker or that fuse and shut down that system when there's a ground fault condition, we don't want to energize metal parts. We want to shut it down. And that's the importance of an equipment grounding conductor in an electrical safety circuit system, okay? Now, does it have to be the wire only type? Absolutely not. But you have all these weak links when it comes to the raceways, couplings, fittings, connections, lock nuts. You have all these things that could go wrong. When you run a wire, then you know you have two points, the point where you start it and the point where it ends at the equipment. So there's a less chance of something going wrong. But under 250.118, there's an entire list of different type of equipment grounded conductors you can use. Now, let's look here and we can see a typical circuit. So this is our overcurrent device. So now we're going to size the wire type. And there's a couple of things that we need to understand when sizing an equipment grounded conductor, okay? This is when we're gonna use table 250.122 specifically. Now, we have to know the size of the overcurrent protective device. Now, this is assuming that you've already done your calculations, you've already done your adjustment and corrections, you know what size circuit you need, you know what size overcurrent you need. Once you know what kind of, uh, type overcurrent device you need in accordance with 240.6a, and you look at the list there, once you establish the size you're gonna have, then you can go to table 250.122. So in our case here, here is a raceway that's being run and the engineer has specified an insulated equipment grounding conductor. So here it is. And this is a 30 amp overcurrent device, in this case a circuit breaker. And so we're gonna have 10 gauge wire and this is a 30 amp device, okay? Now, we need to know the size of the device, which is 30 amps. Then and only then can we go to table 250.122. So let's do that. So here we are at table 250.122 in the National Electrical Code. And you'll see down here that 30 amps doesn't appear. Well, that brings us to an important point. You notice that it says it's based on the overcurrent device. So we have a 30 amps. You notice that it falls between 20 and 60. That's because if you have a 25 amp device, a 30 amp device, a 40 amp device, a 50 amp device, all of those are still going to fall within the space between a 20 and 60. So if it's a 30 amp, you're gonna jump up to the next size and that would be a 60. So in our case, we have a 30 amp overcurrent protective device. Then we're going to use the 60 here because it falls, it's larger than 20. So you're gonna round up to the 60 and that would be a 10 gauge equipment grounding conductor. And if it was an aluminum or copper clad aluminum equipment grounding conductor, then it would be an eight gauge is what we would run with our ungrounded circuits, okay, conductors. All right, so the device is 30 amps. The equipment grounded conductor is a 10 gauge, and that's what we're going to run for our circuit. That is the very extreme basics of understanding how to size based on table 250.122. We didn't talk about all the other nuances that are in the subdivisions of 250.122. Somebody just wanted me to do a video explaining how to use the table, and that's what we did in this episode. So I hope you got something out of that. Uh, until next time, stay safe, and God bless.